Fiona Ellis, we were very happy uh, to have you here, Fiona. Um, she's a reader in philosophy at Heathrop College, University of London. Um, her latest book is God, Value, and Nature, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2014. And it will be available in paperback this coming November. And some of the themes of this work were taken up in the Templeton-funded project, New Models of Religious Understanding, for which she was principal investigator. The other strand of her research involves the philosophy of love and desire, and she's currently working on the question of the relation between desire and the spiritual life with reference to Levinas, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche. So now it has a great uh, pleasure to present uh, Fiona to you. <clears throat> So I've decided I'm going to do this sitting down. And if there's any problem with the microphone, just um, make it clear to me that you can't hear me. So, so there is a problem with the microphone. OK, can you hear now? OK. So the paper that I'm going to present today is really a combination of two things. One, it's the central argument of my book. And two, it's gesturing in the new direction that I'm moving in, in um, concerning the philosophy of desire. So there's a bit on desire towards the end, and if it turns out that I'm running out of time, I'll just skip that bit, but we'll see how we go. I don't want it to be too long and boring. So I'm going to read for the most part. So the first section is called Preliminaries. It has long been supposed that naturalism and atheism, which of course is the title of the paper, I forgot to mention, <laughs> it has long been supposed that naturalism and atheism stand in the closest connection. Thus, John Herman Randall, Jr., writing in 1944, tells us that, quote, there is no room for any supernatural in naturalism. No supernatural or transcendental God, no personal survival after death and that the position, quote, finds itself in thoroughgoing opposition to all forms of thought which assert the existence of a supernatural or transcendental realm of being. Realm of being is capitalized, just to make it absolutely clear that we're concerned with something pretty terrible. So it, opposition to all forms of thought which assert the existence of a supernatural or transcendental realm of being and make knowledge of that realm of fundamental importance to human living. More recently, and in similar anti-supernaturalist vein, we're told in um, Mario's collection with David MacArthur, um, quote, the most familiar definition of naturalism is in terms of the rejection of supernatural entities such as gods, demons, souls, and ghosts that quotes Naturalism in any reading is opposed to supernaturalism, close quotes. Supernatural, supernaturalism involving, quotes, the invocation of an agent or force that somehow stands outside the familiar natural world and whose doings cannot be understood as part of it. And that, ex quote, excluded by anti-supernaturalism are such things as immaterial minds or souls, vital forces, and divine beings. And uh, that last quote is from John Dupre, and the quote before that was Barry Stroud, The Charm of Naturalism. I cut off the footnotes from this paper, so I'm trying to remember as I go along. So the naturalist, or at least the typical naturalist, is opposed to supernaturalism. And this involves a rejection of supernatural entities like gods, demons, souls, and ghosts. This leaves us with, quote, the familiar natural world in which we live and move and have our being. And we're encouraged to suppose that the position is both eminently sensible and intellectually superior. As James Griffin put it in his book, Value Judgments, it is an admirable and deep motive force behind naturalism that we do not need, quote, any world except the ordinary world around us, mainly, as he goes on, the world of humans and animals and happenings in their lives. He continues, 
an otherworldly realm just produces unnecessary problems about what it could possibly be and how we could learn about it. So it's similar to the standard objections that we used to get to G. Moore and philosophers like that. So the implication in all of this is that the naturalist is simply removing from our ontology a superfluous and problematic something else a supernatural realm of being, which, for the unenlightened amongst us, is of fundamental importance both to reality in general and human living in particular. Small wonder that naturalism, quotes from Mario again, has become a slogan in the name of which the vast majority of work in analytic philosophy is pursued, featuring, quotes, what many believe to be the strongest and most promising achievements of 20th century Anglo-American philosophy. So we've got a sense of what the naturalist is seeking to avoid, and an equal sense that its underlying motive is to be applauded. After all, it's surely a good thing to be removing from our ontology realms and items that we don't need. What is less clear is how we're to determine what stands to be eliminated in this way. Ghosts, demons, gods seem reasonable enough contenders. But what about vital forces? And what about God? Are these things superfluous and problematic? And how can we legislate upon what counts as such without first having a clearly defined conception of the nature and limits of the supposedly familiar and ordinary natural world? Now, the naturalism in the name of which the vast majority of work in analytic philosophy is pursued tends to be defined in exclusively scientific terms, as we know from yesterday. Thus, we're told by Randall, again, that the naturalist's creed presupposes, quotes, reliance on an unrestricted scientific method and the consequent rejection of any form of supernaturalism. And... Um, Mario's book again, um, the editors of a recent collection claim that the position involves, quote, a commitment, and this is familiar from yesterday from Mario's talk, a commitment to an exclusively scientific conception of nature, the ontological theme, and a reconception of the traditional relation between philosophy and science, according to which philosophical inquiry is conceived of as continuous with science, and that we know from yesterday is the methodological theme. So the question of the limits of science is no less problematic than that of the limits of nature. Again, this is a familiar theme from yesterday. And it's understandable that there's been disagreement over what it could mean to commit to an exclusively scientific conception of nature and an unrestricted scientific method. According to one way of thinking, we should all be reductive materialists or materialist naturalists as Tom Nagel puts it in his recent book, Mind and Cosmos, quote, among the scientists and philosophers who do express views about the natural order as a whole, reductive materialism is widely assumed to be the only serious possibility. possibility. Now, reductive materialism, as we know, admits of various characterizations, ranging from David Armstrong's, the natural world contains nothing but the entities recognized by physics, to John Dupre's more recent, if there is only material stuff in the world, no spooky stuff, and the word spooky is pr pretty familiar in this debate, then the properties of stuff must ultimately explain everything. Dupre challenges, um, uh, this is in, in Dupre's um, review of Nagel's book on the Notre Dame Philosophical Reviews, he challenges Nagel's account of the position's supposed prevalence objecting that it expresses a once popular view which has been, quotes, almost entirely rejected by philosophers actually engaged with the physical and biological sciences. It simply has no interesting relation to the diversity of things that scientists actually do. Close quotes. So we're to suppose that the scientists themselves have moved beyond this paradigm Although Dupre claims elsewhere that its reductive spirit continues to animate philosophical thought, and a recent interview in Scientific American finds the physicist George Ellis 
bemoaning the fact that many of his fellow scientists remain, quote, strong reductionists. The strong reductionist takes the measure of reality, measure of nature to be physics, a more moderate naturalism defines this measure, and this is clear from Mario's and Lynn's talks, defines this measure with reference to a broader conception of science. Why just physics? How on earth could that explain everything? And what reason could be given for insisting upon this restriction? And an even more moderate position challenges the assumption that the offending restriction can be lifted only in terms which are restricted by science. Why just science? How on earth could that explain everything? And what reason could be given for insisting upon this restriction? It's in the context of giving expression to these anti-scientistic complaints that we find John McDowell recommending that we, quotes, discourage this dazzlement by science, which leads us to suppose that genuine truth is restricted to what can be validated by their methods. It should go without saying that this is not a rejection of science. It's anti-scientism, not anti-science. And again, that's clear from Mario's talk. Now, the atheist and scientist Richard Dawkins has been suitably and familiarly dazzled, well, in one obvious sense at least. Thus, he insists that, quote, quote, God's existence or non-existence is a scientific fact about the universe. The presence or absence of a creative superintelligence is unequivocally a scientific question. His professed aim being to, quote, attack God, all gods, anything and everything supernatural, wherever and whenever they have been or will be invented. And that's from his book, The God Delusion. <clears throat> For Dawkins, then, the scientific fact about the universe is that God is absent from its domain, and he concludes on this basis that atheism must be embraced. His attitude would be embraced by those naturalists who insist that the limits of nature are to be circumscribed by science, and they express a similar antipathy towards anything and everything supernatural, to requote Dawkins. As noted, however, the limits of science are themselves in question, and even supposing that we have a relatively clear grasp upon what counts as science and what does not, there's no justification for launching the kind of attack Dawkins has in mind. For if supernatural is supernatural is the logical complement of natural in the scientific sense, then the astounding claim is that what stands to be rejected is anything which doesn't fall within the explanatory domain of science. Now, McDowell and Griffin reject scientific naturalism or scientistic naturalism, but they're happy to describe themselves as naturalists. After all, and, and this is a, a really important thought, I think, after all, naturalism is motivated by the admirable thought that we do not need any world other than the familiar or nat ordinary world around us. And that, to go back to Griffin, another worldly realm just produces unnecessary problems about what it could possibly be and how we could learn about it. Now, it should be obvious from what I've said that the distinction between what is intra and otherworldly is entirely unclear, and that the more liberal, or as I call it, expansive naturalist rejects the scientific naturalist's conception of these notions. That is to say, he denies that the scientist has a monopoly on nature and explanation, and he must therefore deny that an otherworldly realm comes into play when these scientific strictures are dropped. So the expansive naturalist is a supernaturalist from the perspective of the scientific naturalist. For he insists that we precisely do need something more than the world as comprehended by science. However, he would deny that this more is to be located in a second supernatural realm. 
for his conception of nature exceeds these scientific limits. And that grants him, to, grants him the right to say that it is this world, this familiar, ordinary world, which is to be comprehended in these more expansive terms. As Griffin puts it, quote, the boundaries of the natural are pushed outward a bit in a duly motivated way. Now, the natural world thus understood incorporates value, an important focus of people like Griffin and McDowell and Wiggins, being the moral values which come into play when beings like ourselves make moral distinctions and respond accordingly. It's granted that science has some role to play in explaining the relevant responses. The human science has been of particular significance in this context. You know, how come we got into the position where we can make moral distinctions? Um, the, sci the human scientist can say an awful lot in, in this context. What is denied, however, is that science can cover all of the explanatory ground, a concession which becomes rather less daunting once it's allowed that there's more to explanation and reality than what the scientist comprehends. Values, an essential part of the, of the expansive naturalist's picture, but he agrees with his scientific opponent that, and, and I'm now going to gradually bring God into the equation, so this is an important move. So value is an essential part of the expansive naturalist's conception of nature, but he agrees with his scientific opponent that the natural world must be shorn of any reference to God or gods, and we're encouraged to suppose that a move in either direction is both unnecessary and problematic. The charge is familiar, and in what follows, I want to grant with the naturalist that we should be resisting unnecessary and problematic expansions, but deny that it follows that naturalism must be atheistic. So I'm wanting to say that a move in the direction of God can be perfectly unproblematic. <clears throat> to put it again, I shall argue that the expansive naturalist is operating with a deficient conception of God, namely one according to which God is, an, is a problematic and excessive, unnecessary something else, that such items, as we know already, merit rejection, but that it doesn't follow from this that we should reject God. So that's the basic argument, and I'm going to repeat it in a, in a little while. So the general idea is that expansive naturalists like Griffin and McDowell are operating with a deficient conception of God, according to which God is a problematic something else. And in this respect, their conception of God corresponds to the scientific naturalist's conception of their conception of value, which for the scientific naturalist is a problematic something else. So that's going to be the general structure of the dialectic. As I shall spell out, my argumentative strategy in this context involves following, as I've just said, involves following the structure of the expansive naturalist's response to the charge that his own expanded conception of nature raises similar difficulties. So my charge is that his objection to theistic naturalism merits a similar response. And, and that's a complex line of thought. I'm going to repeat it, and we can talk about it later. But again, the, the general idea is that if this works, then the expansive naturalist should accept my further ac expansion in the direction of God, because I'm really just borrowing the arguments that he, he's already used to dispose of scientific naturalism. Okay. To put it another way, I'm suggesting that there's scope for allowing that nature is God-involving as well as being value-involving, and that this move can be defended on expansive naturalistic grounds, hence the expansive expansive naturalist has every reason to take this argument seriously. 
I'm suggesting also that if he doesn't take this option seriously, then he's really no better than a scientific naturalist. I'm not saying that he has to accept the position. I'm just saying that he's got to be open-minded enough to see that it's kind of an interesting argument, just like he's trying to get the scientific naturalist to be op more open-minded. The scientific naturalist being someone who refuses to countenance the possibility that an expansive form of naturalism is philosophically defensible. I mean, it remains to be seen where this leaves the question of the relation between God and value. And we shall see that Levinas's position puts pressure on the idea that there's a genuine distinction here. Um, we, we, we shall see that the positions at issue all have the potential to merge into one another, another. And I think this is part of the dialectic where you go from scientific naturalism, expanded scientific naturalism, as Lynn was spelling out, then non-scientific expansive naturalism, and then expansive naturalism that incorporates God. The boundaries between these positions are really porous, I think, given the nature of the case. And that kind of porous nature of the boundaries is something I'm exploiting here. So we move now on to the section Naturalism and God where I just want to spell out in a bit more detail um, the dialectic that I've just summed up. I want to begin with McDowell. McDowell's too good a philosopher to insist upon the truth of atheism and we find him using the imagery of darkness to refer to that which exceeds the limits of his more relaxed or liberal conception of nature. He calls it the region of darkness. It's here that we're returned to his own preferred conception of the meaning of natural, namely, quotes, not supernatural, not occult, not magical. And he adds, there's no need for me to take a stand on whether everything is natural in that sense, thereby, among other things, giving needless offence to people who think respect for modern science is compatible with a kind of religious belief that preserves room for the supernatural. Now, the imagery of darkness would suit the apophatic theologian, but McDowell's no such thing, intentionally at least, and seems to believe that this mysterious dimension, such as it is, could have no bearing upon nature and our natural human being. It is, after all, occult and magical, and it calls to mind the, quotes, rampant Platonism he criticizes elsewhere, with its implication that our lives are, quotes, mysteriously split, somehow taking place both in nature and in some alien, read for that spooky realm, in Plato's heaven, perhaps, he adds. <clears throat> now, McDowell's criticisms of the supernatural, and here I'm just spelling out the dialectic of my approach, McDowell's criticisms of the supernatural are structurally equivalent to the scientific naturalists' criticisms of McDowell's conception of value. So, McDowell's criticisms here are structurally equivalent to those of the scientific naturalist. <clears throat> when he objects to the values which form part of the expansive naturalist's ontology. So we find Peter Railton, who I would describe as an expansive scientific naturalist and Lynn would describe as a non-reductive naturalist, I think. So we find Peter Railton in the context of a lengthy exchange with David Wiggins, bemoaning the, quotes, worrisome ontological expansion which ensues if we exceed his own preferred social scientific terms, to which he adds that we, we can explain everything that needs to be explained about value without making this problematic move. The relevant entities, and I'm just um, repeating what Griffin said, just produce unnecessary problems about what they could possibly be and how we could learn about them. So, Relton saying that about Wiggins or McDowell's or Griffin's move. So, the refrain's getting familiar, and we might add that there's a knife edge between the position endorsed by Relton, sensible naturalism that avoids appeal to suspect entities, and that endorsed by Wiggins, McDowell, Griffin, 
etc. Mario. Likewise, a sensible naturalism which avoids appeal to suspect entities, and, and Lynn, of course. They both acknowledge this similarity, um, Wiggins and McDowell, and are bemused by the supposed differences and disagreements between their positions. Sorry, that's um, Railton and Wiggins. So towards the end of this exchange, they're saying, we seem to agree on nearly every um, issue here, and I'm not sure why we're still disagreeing. Is it terminological? Not clear. But it's a really interesting exchange. So what does any of this have to do with God? Well, the expansive naturalist conception of religious reality, um, that region of darkness, turns it into something occult and alien, i.e. supernatural in the pejorative sense. But what if this conception of religious reality can be challenged in the way that the expansive naturalist challenges the scientific naturalist's understanding of his own preferred conception of value? So in both cases, it's a matter of saying the relevant X is not an occult and or spooky and alien something else which is irrelevant to our natural being and to be set apart from anything pertaining to nature. Rather, it's already a dimension of nature and something to which we're capable of relating by virtue of being the natural beings that we are on a suitably expanded conception of nature and natural. It's now coming every three seconds in response to this. <laughs> Now, the expansive naturalist could try to block this parallel by saying, look, the two cases are completely different. God's occult and alien in a way that values not. But this response simply begs the question against the possibility of an alternative framework which challenges the assumption that God is to be viewed in these pejorative terms and hence that nature must exclude him. Doesn't this lead to a form of pantheism if I'm saying that nature is God-involving? After all, a naturalist, we're told time and time again, is committed to a one-world position, and I seem to be suggesting that God can be accommodated within this framework. Now, the theist, my theist, is no pantheist, but he denies that God sits alongside nature, and I think this is a standard theistic move, what I'm saying here. He denies that God sits alongside nature to create the unnecessary problems to which Griffin refers as if it's a matter of adding an irrelevant and spooky realm to the familiar, ordinary, natural world. Rather, it is this world that's God involving, God being actively present in all things. So God's rescued from some alien realm, to repeat McDowell's terminology, but he's not reducible to the world in which he's present, for he is its source and sustainer, and as such to be distinguished from anything within it or indeed beyond it. Now the theist will claim further that we can enter into loving fellowship with this actively present God. That our receptivity in this context brings personal transformation and that this transformation is expressed most significantly or very significantly at the level of morality. We shall find Levinas claiming that being moral is the only way of relating authentically to God, anxious as he is to deflate the cognitive pretensions of those for whom God is a mere object of theory. Now, Levinas offers a salutary reminder of our cognitive limitations in this context. And his example will be important when we consider what it could really mean to be a theist theistic naturalist. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that there's any easy route to theism, nor that the difficulties it confronts are not genuine. My aim at this stage is simply to make clear that the typical naturalist's conception of these difficulties can be challenged, and that once we move beyond the unduly restrictive parameters of scientism, there's scope for questioning the assumption that an expansion in the direction of God is bound to be philosophically disastrous. The expansive naturalist has shown us anything. It's that the limits of nature are entirely unclear. <coughs> so in the next section, I just want to consider a worry and a response to what I've said so far. Now, you might say, 
sure, the limits of nature are really unclear. I mean, that has been spelled out from the talks yesterday. But there is, in fact, a further reason for resisting the kind of move that I'm recommending, namely that it goes against the prevalent assumption that naturalism and theism are logically incompatible. And that, well, it's a very prevalent assumption. You get it in people like Plantinga, for example, and in most of the theists that I've spoken to, or most of the philosophers of religion I've spoken to then. I, I think that's an important distinction. After all, it's standard in philosophy of religion today to define naturalism in a way that excludes the existence of gods and God, Plantinga. It's standard also to suppose that naturalism is equivalent to scientific naturalism, as we've seen. My response to this worry takes us back to what's been said already. The scientific naturalist does not have the monopoly on the meaning of the term naturalism, as we know from well, Mario and Lynn's work. And recent, so recent philosophy testifies to the pliability of the term naturalism. So its meaning is hardly fixed, and those who have embraced the term to their own particular ends have done so with an eye to the advantage it procures. In particular, it gives their philosophical endeavours the seal of empirical respectability. No spooky entities here, nothing um, occult, alien, magical, or whatever. Now, this meaning has not been stretched in a theistic direction, at least not by contemporary naturalists, and reservations on this score are entirely understandable. But this doesn't rule out such a move. And if I'm right, there are naturalistic arguments to this end on the suitably expanded conception thereof. Now, the virtues of this move should be apparent, for we're in a position to challenge the conclusion, common to most naturalists, that talk of God belongs to the realm of idle metaphysics, that it comprises an esoteric discipline which is irrelevant to what really matters and that it has no bearing upon the question of nature and our natural human being. You know, that question of human living that the um, American naturalists were talking about at the beginning of the paper. A further notable advantage of my approach is that it offers the prospects for defending a theistic framework using philosophical resources which can genuinely appeal to an atheist at least one who's moved beyond the limits of scientific naturalism. Now, this point has been of particular significance to me. I've long been persuaded that there's nothing remotely pernicious or embarrassing about metaphysical inquiry per se, and that reference to Plato's heaven or the kingdom of God need not spell inevitable philosophical disaster. At the same time, however, I'm aware of how problematic these notions can sound to contemporary philosophical ears, you know, um, a, a lot of my contemporaries and some of my colleagues. So what better way to vindicate these notions than by reference to a metaphysical framework which demands no more than a resistance to scientism, a spirit of open-mindedness, and a preparedness to go where one's arguments lead? I also find it ironic and amusing that the best philosophical defense of the position towards which I've been gradually moving should come from a way of thinking which, at one level at least, will have nothing to do with God. Now, this refusal concedes nothing to the vitriolic tendencies of the militant atheist, understandably so, given that the philosophers in question have no particular axe to grind and have seen through the fundamentalist faith which tends to drive such attacks, and that was a theme yesterday as well. Rather, and in true phenomenological spirit, they seek to return us to the things themselves, guarding against the imposition of frameworks which preclude the possibility of meeting this aim. It's in the context of appreciating this met methodological stance that we can be begin to appreciate the theistic significance of their claims, or so I contend. <clears throat> so this section four now, I'm just gonna introduce a bit of Levinas and how his position relates to the question of the relation between atheism and theism. So this is all very well, you might say, on the basis of what I've said already. This is all very well, but I've said next to nothing about God other than to make it clear what he's not, not spooky, not belonging to some alien, supernatural in a pejorative sense realm. So I've made clear what he's not and suggested that he's actively present in all things without being reducible to them. 
I've also made a point of mentioning Levinas's worries about saying anything at all in this context, and his idea that we relate to God only at the level of morality. The idea that we relate to God only at the level of morality surely compromises the possibility of moving in a theistic direction. And, and this line of thought here has been very important. Um, after all, the secular expansive naturalist, someone like Griffin or Wiggins or McDowell or maybe Mario, I'm not sure, the secular expansive naturalist operates at the level of morality and his framework doesn't involve God. Now, it remains open, I think, that the secular expansive naturalist is just wrong about this. But if we add to the equation that God talk is excluded in a way that sometimes Levinas seems to be implying, then it's difficult to see how the relevant difference between the two positions can be made out, i.e. the difference between a secular expansive naturalism that doesn't involve God and a theistic position which claims to involve God but has it that you can say nothing about God and that the only thing that you can say, you can say at the level of um, our relation to moral value. It's surely a condition upon defending a theistic form of naturalism that it can be expressed as such and distinguished from its atheistic counterpart. I mean, I do think it's really philosophically significant that there's a knife edge between all of the positions that we're talking about. Now, Levinas <clears throat> counts as a theist in the sense that he operates with a God-involving conception of reality. And he makes no bones about this dimension of his position. But, as I've said, He's suspicious of the cognitive pretensions of theology and anxious to dis distance himself from the invented gods of our wishful and egoistic thinking. He would object that these inventions make for the most pernicious form of atheism, pernicious in the sense that it's so easily mistaken for its opposite. You know, so he would classify as a form of atheism any supposed theistic position which views God as someone in the sky there to make everything come true for you and satisfy all of your desires, etc. It's in the context of appreciating this point that we can see the significance of a kind of atheism which for Levinas has profound theistic significance, namely that which quotes, voids the child's heaven so that we're no longer beholden to the offending idols. God is said to retire from the world in this sense and to hide his face. Um, I mentioned when I was talking to Lynn and Mario yesterday that I thought that one possible model for thinking about God's omnipresence in things is to say that God can be omnipresent in things only by being absent. And it's that kind of paradoxical thought that I think Levinas is trying to articulate. So God is said to retire from the world in this sense and to hide his face. All the better to be revealed, we're to suppose, the revelation in question involving, quote, a God who renounces all aids to manifestation and appeals instead to the full maturity of the responsible man. It's Levinas's contention that we relate to God and know him by being moral. And he often suggests that this is the only such way, quote, ethics is not the corollary of the vision of God, it is that very vision. Ethics is an optic such that everything I know of God and everything I can hear of his word and reasonably say to him <clears throat> must find an ethical expression. To know God is to know what is to be done. To know God is to know what's to be done. <clears throat> now, Levinas exposes the limitations of any position which treats God as just one more item within or beyond the world, <clears throat> applauding the removal of the familiar and offending otherworldly realms. So Levinas agrees with the naturalist that we should be anti-supernaturalists in this sense, i.e. <clears throat> he agrees that we should be rejecting 
suspect supernaturalism, where you've got this familiar world and another world locked onto it. And the problem is, how do we gain access to that other world? What does it have to do with this? We don't need it, all of that. <clears throat> so he agrees with the naturalist that we've got to be anti-supernaturalist in this sense, but he denies that this involves rejecting God, for God is revealed in our moral interactions with others. So as he, as he sees it, atheism is not invariably opposed to theism, when, e.g., it clears the way for a genuine revelation of God, and theism is most authentically expressed at the level of morality. <clears throat> now, if we accept that God is revealed in our moral interactions with others, then the secular expansive naturalist is a closet theist. And the move I'm recommending we make on his behalf has already been made by him the moment he moves beyond scientific naturalism. It seems equally plausible, though, to say that the theism that I'm talking about here is indiscernible from atheism and that such a theism is unworthy of the name. After all, how can God be part of the picture if the picture is accepted by those whose conception of nature doesn't involve God? Now, this sceptical response is understandable, but it does presuppose that the question of value is already closed and that it has nothing to do with God, and that it's entirely clear in any case what it means to bring God into the equation, and it's not. The themes with which we began, the nature and limits of nature and value, make it clear that all of these questions remain entirely open. The central issue being whether there's a conception of God which improves upon the crude supernaturalist model to which the typical naturalist is in thrall. <clears throat> it would therefore beg the very question at issue to insist that we know exactly what it means or could not mean to describe nature in God-involving terms. But don't we need to say something about God himself rather than simply focusing upon our moral responses, which is um, the kind of response that, for example, Karl Rahner makes to the kind of position that involves reducing God to morality. And wouldn't this, saying something more about God, offer a more fruitful way of clarifying the distinction between atheism and theism? Now, I've already acknowledged Levinas's reservations about theology. He does talk about the importance of recuperating a form of theology that comes after the glimpse of holiness, as he puts it. So I've already acknowledged that he's got Levinas has got reservations about theology, but I've noted that he's happy to describe his position in God-involving terms. So there's a clear enough sense in which he is talking about God, and it's certainly no part of his position that the God to which he refers is a mere idol, i.e. something less than God. Crucially, however, he believes that there are limits to what can be said if we're to avoid, avoid being stuck with these lesser gods. And he insists also that whatever we do say in this context must be commensurate with the reality we're struggling to comprehend. Now, Levinas is prepared to acknowledge that this reality that we're struggling to comprehend is both infinite and moral, but he denies that it can be adequately appreciated in theoretical terms. Why? Because God cannot be reduced to an object of theory and the irreducibly moral dimension of his reality must be reflected in our knowledge. To know God is to know what is to be done. Or, as he puts it elsewhere, <clears throat> the infinite is not in front of me. The infinite is not in front of me. It is I who express it. And we can compare these telling remarks to my favourite entry from Simone Weil's notebooks. She says, the real aim is not to see God in all things. It is that God, through us, should see the things that we see. God has got to be on the side of the subject and not on that of the object during all those intervals of time when, forsaking the contemplation of the light, we imitate the descending movement of God 
so as to turn ourselves towards the world. <clears throat> now, all of this is to say rather a lot about God. It involves claiming that God is a God of love and goodness, that we're capable of expressing God's love and goodness, and that we're capable of knowing God by virtue of loving like him. Now, this little section on desire I'm going to skip because it's too complex and long. So I'm going to go to the bottom of page eight. Um, Levinas avoids the suspect supernaturalism, which locates God in a second supernatural world. Agreeing with the naturalist that our focus must be upon this universe, this world, this nature. And that's clearly a really important theme of Simone Weil's as well. His idea that God is transcendent to the point of absence suggests a further concession to naturalism, for it implies that God has been squeezed out of the picture altogether. This impression is further corroborated with the emphasis Levinas places upon our status as moral agents. You know, it's a bit like that move that's made in the history of philosophy, which is forget all about God and focus instead upon our autonomy as moral agents. So all of this implies that God has been squeezed out of the picture. And as I've just said, this impression is further corroborated with the emphasis Levinas places upon our status as moral agents. And it'd be, it'd be easy to conclude that the religious quest has been reduced without remainder to the moral quest. It should be clear from what has been said, however, that Levinas's conception of morality is irreducibly God-involving and that what he seeks to eliminate is not God, but the various idols which stand in the way of genuine revelation, a paradigm, perhaps, of what it could mean for God to be actively present in all things. And that just goes back to what I said about God's active presence requiring that he withdraw in some fundamental sense so that we can do his work. And that, obviously, is fundamental to Simone Weil's conception of decreation, um, the idea of God withdrawing. <clears throat> so I come now to the conclusions where I just want to sum up what I've said. So I began by noting the commonplace assumption that naturalism and atheism stand or fall together. This assumption has tended to go hand in hand with the claims that naturalism is, or at least ought to be, the default philosophical position, and that it stands opposed to supernaturalism, which latter involves the postulation of some second supernatural realm in addition to the familiar natural world. Theism is treated as a brand of supernaturalism, and the complaint is that, like all supernaturalisms, it multiplies entities beyond necessity. We do not need a world beyond the ordinary world around us. I've argued that the conceptual boundaries in this debate are entirely unclear. That's to say, we're not remotely clear about the limits of nature, as is clear from yesterday. Ergo, we're not remotely clear about the limits of supernature and the supernatural, nor about what it really means to be a naturalist. I've defended an expansive naturalist picture along the lines recommended by McDowell, Wiggins, Griffin, Mario, Lynn, I think, and argued with them that scientific naturalism is an ideological prejudice. I've argued also that we should take seriously the possibility of a further expansion in the direction of God so as to allow that the natural world is itself God-involving as well as being value-involving. If this is right, then naturalism is not invariably atheistic, and theism can be naturalistically motivated. Now, I take it that this will come as no big surprise to the typical theist. And I, I think that probably most of the theists in this room would think that the position I'm describing is completely sensible and probably pretty familiar as well. In, in my experience, it's only very problematic to a certain kind of philosopher of religion, the philosopher of religion in the Anglo-American tradition. I mean, that's been my experience at least, but you may want to correct me on that score. So I take it that what I've said will come as no surprise to the typical theist, the typical theist being an expansive naturalist of the God-involving kind, I think. 
Now, Levinas was important to my dialectic because there's a knife edge between his position and the secular expansive naturalist, someone like McDowell, Griffin, Wiggins, etc., who allow that nature's value involving and that value cannot be wholly comprehended in scientific terms. I, so they both operate with a value involving conception of nature, and in both cases, there is a clear sense in which God is absent from the domain. It would be more appropriate in the case of Levinas to say that God has been put in his proper place, the relevant site for Levinas being us in one important sense, so that God is revealed when we, are, when we stand in moral relations to others and act accordingly. We express the infinite in that sense. God is on the side of the subject. Now, Levinas offers a way forward for one who believes that suspect supernaturalism is a thinly disguised form of atheism. He veers close to atheism in one clear enough sense, i.e. because God isn't part of the picture, or God isn't part of the picture. But this atheism, such as it is, promises a more authentic revelation of God and a more authentic way of relating to God. It appeals in particular because the model at which we arrive involves a rejection of the very things which for the typical naturalist and the typical Anglo-American philosopher make religious frameworks so problematic in the first place and superfluous. Small wonder that there's a knife edge between this position, Levinas's God-involving position, and the position of the typical non-scientistic, secular, expansive naturalist. It is such a figure, after all, the expansive naturalist who insists rightly that suspect supernaturalism and reductive naturalism are two sides of the same problematic coin operating from within the same framework and that we do not need any world other than the ordinary familiar world around us. And that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>